Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about video games, and in particular, an amazing video game called Space War, perhaps the first video game ever made. And you might say, why are we talking about video games? This is a serious course about the development of computers and the internet. Well, there's probably nothing more important, more influential in determining the way computers evolve than the advent of video games. Video games that allowed you to interact in real time with your computer, to have easy to understand graphical displays, and that were fun. They weren't just for number crunching. And this helps spur the computer revolution to being something that becomes personal and interactive and easy to use. It begins in 1946 with the MIT Tech Model Railway Club. This is a group of true hackers and geeks who hang around in the basement of a building in MIT where radar had been invented. And what they do is they create incredibly great model railway systems that are historically accurate, that are beautiful, that have bridges and buildings and wonderful circuits and controllers. If you really want to read about them, uh, the opening of Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, which is one of the seminal books about the digital revolution, begins with the hackers of the Tech Model Railway Club at M MIT and with a concept that's call, that they call the hands-on imperative. What does that mean? It means you should be able to get your hands on things. Back when uh, computers in the early days, you had to bring punch cards that were batch processed and uh, sort of the experts in the computer ran the punch cards overnight for you. What the Tech Model Railway Club and other hackers wanted to do is to get their hands on, to be able to hack things, to be able to make them the way they wanted it. And that hands-on imperative is what drove the MIT Tech Model Railway Club. You know, many of the people in the club were worried about the wonderful buildings and the trains and what they look like on the tracks and, you know, how the bridges worked and how to make the whole thing beautiful and historically accurate. But there was a subcommittee of the MIT Tech Model Railway Club that was in charge of signals and power, the signals and power subcommittee. And they tended to all the relays and the wires and the circuits. Uh, as Steve Levy said, in this tangled web, they saw beauty. And catch that word circuit for a moment, because there they are creating beneath the railway board and in other places, circuits filled with on off switches and controls. And these are of course computer geeks. And they're beginning to understand the power of circuits to regulate things. So to them, the Signals and Power Subcommittee that was in charge of the circuits for the railway, that was just like being a computer programmer. It was just like what Claude Shannon and others did, which is express logic with on-off switches. In September 1961, the Digital Equipment Corporation based in Boston donated the prototype they had built of a computer called the PDP-1. And that computer was very special because it appealed to people with the hands-on imperative. In other words, it didn't have a whole lot of punch cards you had to enter. You could work with it directly with human interaction using a keyboard. In this case, in the earliest case, which is an old typewriter that had been repurposed. And it had a digital monitor that could display graphics. It was the size, the main computer, of about three refrigerators. So it was pretty big, but it was personal. One person could use it, didn't have to timeshare it. And it could be directly interactive. You didn't have to wait for the processing of punch cards or anything else. You could just type something into the computer or point to something on the screen and the computer would interact instantly. And so a group 
of the MIT Railway Club, some of the hardcore hackers in that club, especially on the Signals and Power subcommittee, began to circle the uh, computer and they formed a cabal. They called it the Higgum Street Institute because that's where they had their uh, apartment where they lived. And they wanted to conjure up something to do with it, something that would be fun, that would make use of all the graphics in the machine. So they all work together as a team, creativity being a team sport, to figure out what could they do with this computer that would actually make use of all of its hands-on interactive graphical features. And the lead was a guy named Steve Russell. He talked really fast like a chipmunk, but sometimes he procrastinated. So he was called Slug Russell by his friends. He loved science fiction and science fiction movies and trashy science fiction novels. He was particularly fond of a genre of science fiction called space opera, which was a specialty of some really schlocky writer named Doc Smith. And as uh, Steve Russell said about Doc Smith's book, his heroes had a strong tendency to get pursued by the villain across the galaxy and to have to invent their way out of their problem while they were being pursued. And so that gave Steve Russell and his friends the idea of what they could do with this PDP-1 computer from DEC, which was build a game that was like a space opera, that was like a space war. So in the Christmas break of 1961, Steve Russell, helped by his friends, create the rudiments of a game called Space War. They're able to use the toggle switches and controls and some of the commands you use uh, on the PDP-1 to create dots and have them move across the screen. And they even then converted the dots so that it looked like a skinny rocket ship and one looked like a cigar rocket ship. And they found ways that you could shoot a dot out of one of these lines and it would go towards wherever you aimed it. And if the dot interacted with one of the spaceships, they figured out a way to program it to make it look like that spaceship had exploded. And it became an open source project. This is really important. In other words, it wasn't a guy or a gal going to a garage and having a light bulb moment and inventing this. Steve Russell took the paper tape, you know, those paper strips that had punches of zeros and ones, or actually holes and no holes, to do binary program. It was a long tape, and every night he put it in the box where, uh, next to the computer, a big brown outbox, where anybody who wanted to take it and run the program and improve it could do so. So one of his friends adds a gravitational force to it. So if you get near the sun or one of the stars, you actually see it curve, the spaceship curves slightly. And then somebody figured out that it would draw you into it. But if you did it just right, if you pass the sun just right using that gravitational force as a guide, it would be a slingshot that would make your rocket go faster. So over and over using open source, meaning it was free and open for everybody to improve. Nobody owned or controlled the code. It was like Wikipedia. It was crowdsourced. They all made new features on the space war game. One guy named Peter Sampson did something great. He loved astronomy. And he went to all the astronomy books. And instead of just having random dots, he made it so that the background, as the spaceships moved across the screen, were astronomically correct constellations rather than just random dots. And one of the most important inventions was the remote control. Because people were playing this game at the MIT basement, and they were two people would play it, and they'd both be on the keyboard and they'd be jostling into each other. And so somebody figured out, just like you could do it with the model railway, you could take some of the components of a model railway and you could make a toggle switch and a red button and each player 
that have a remote control. One more step to making computers interactive and personal. So with the remote control, you can do all sorts of things, including with that little red button there uh, that you could push with your thumb. You could jump into hyperspace. If you were about to get exploded, your rocket ship, you could hit that red button and it would take you to another dimension and you disappear. But people say, well, that was cheating. So you can only do it. They ended up making rules that in the computer that you can only do it three times during a game. And if you did it, it would take you into hyperspace for a few seconds, but you didn't know where you'd reappear. So they kept improving the game, <clears throat> making it more exciting, adding elements to it. And so you get the fundamentals of modern computer programming and modern computers. First of all, it's created collaboratively. The source code is free and it's open source. Uh, open source uh, software, meaning anybody can modify the source code. As Steve Russell said, people asked for copies of the source code. And of course, we gave them out. I love that phrase, of course. It was back when people thought software wants to be free. Now that's gonna end up being a controversial concept. Bill Gates is gonna push back on it, but initially, the software that told these computers how to run was open and free for anyone to use. And with this new game, Steve Russell said, it allowed us to get our hands on a computer and make it respond to us in real time. You all probably don't know what it feels like to have a computer that you can't interact with instantly that you have to send instructions in and then wait an hour or two for the printout to show you what the results were. Probably the most important thing about computers today is that they're instantly interactive. And that comes to a large extent from the people at the MIT Tech Model Railway Club in the early 1960s who wanted, because they were hackers, to have their hands-on imperative, and they also wanted to have fun, and they helped make computers what they are today. Thanks.